Shalom and good morning, everyone. So today we are dealing with the 80, question 81, and it is the final question from the Young Baptist Catechism. So as we talked about before, we're going to be doing a Q&A next week. So we're hoping that uh, we're going to have uh, Pastor Gerardo come up here, and he's going to join me in doing Q&A, and possibly Brother James is going to come up. And uh, so basically, we've covered, this is going to be the 81st question. So if anyone has any questions about anything we've covered in the 81 questions that we've dealt with in the Sunday schools, you have, you have an opportunity to ask any question on any one of those topics, and we will do the best we can to answer it to the best of our abilities. Uh, and if you have a question that is not on that topic... Maybe you have a question about the end times and you want to know what Gerardo's view is or my views or James's, or you want to talk about some other doctrine. Maybe you have a more specific question about baptism or covenant theology or, or any of those other theologies. So just feel free to, to bring the, the questions. We're hoping that we can have fun and spend a good 30 to 35 minutes just answering questions next week. So please write them down or whatever it is that you want to do. And uh, Stan, do you have the microphone? Or No? Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, they're going to hand uh, Stan uh, the microphone so that if anyone has a question in the, today's Sunday School, they can ask it. Did you have a comment or a question? Yeah, I was going to say to compare it to you guys, because like, I know sometimes it might be an uh, answer that might require some study. Mm -hmm. uh, was there possibly a way to set email like, questions just so it kind of gives you guys a heads up? Yeah, I think that'd be fine. Sure, that, that'd be great too. That'd be, that'd be fantastic. If anyone wants to email us or, or anything like that, uh, we, we can uh, prepare with a better answer to those questions. So that's a great idea. Okay, all right. But, but just in general, if anyone is not going to do that, I'm just going to leave that open. Uh, if anyone, because we, what we don't want to do is schedule a Q&A and then everybody's just sitting down and they have no questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Okay, so... To begin, let's do question 81. What is man's primary purpose? And uh, did you have a comment, sister? <laughs> okay. All right. Answer. Man's primary purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Uh, the scriptures are, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 whom have, whom have I in heaven but you, and besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Amen. Psalm 30, 73, 25 through 26. As I said a moment ago, this is the final question from the Young Baptist Catechism, A Beginner's Guide to the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689 by Adam Morrell. And of course, it is based on the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, 1689. Uh, and because we are here at Acts Reformed Church, we are in West Covina, California. We are a Reformed Baptist church. We are confessional and we hold to the 1689. So uh, let's explore this issue a little bit because I, when I was thinking about the Sunday School this week, I was thinking how do, what notes do I need to touch in this particular study? Like there's a lot of different ways that you can go. And so I wanted to go at it from this angle as I was putting together the, the outline. Let's begin with the word glory. Glory, beauty, power, or honor, a quality of God's character that emphasizes his greatness and authority. The word is used in three senses in the Bible. God's moral beauty and perfection of character. This divine quality is beyond human understanding, Psalm 113 through 4. All people fall short of it, Romans 3.23. Two, God's moral beauty and perfection as a visible presence, while God's glory is not a substance. At times, God does reveal his perfection to humans in a visible way. Such a display of the presence of God is often seen as a fire or dazzling light, but sometimes as an act of power. Some examples from the Old Testament are the pillar of, uh, of cloud and fire, Exodus 13, 21. The Lord's deliverance of the Israelites at the Red Sea, Exodus 14 and especially his glory in the tabernacle, 9.23-24, and the temple, 1 Kings 8.11. Since the close of the Old Testament, the glory of God has been shown mainly in Christ, Luke 9.29-32, John 2.11, and the members of his church. Christ now shares his divine glory with his followers, John 17.5-6 and 22, 
so that in their lives, Christians are being transformed into the glorious image of God, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Believers will be fully uh, glorified at the end of time in God's heavenly presence, Romans 5.2, Colossians 3.4. There the glory of God will be seen everywhere, Revelation 21.23. Third, praise at times. God's glory may, may mean the honor and audible praise that his creatures give to him, Psalm 115-1. Uh, verse 1, Revelation 5, 12 through 13. And this is from the Nelson's Illustrated uh, Bible Dictionary. Now, so this is the idea of what we get from the glory of God. Now, how do we apply this understanding? Because you have the glory of God, which was reflected in the presence of God, as is illustrated in the Old Testament, where you have the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the temple, etc. You have God revealing himself to, to people in the Old Testament. You have the vision in Isaiah chapter 6, where God, uh, well, Isaiah has a vision of God. He sees the angels, and the angels are worshiping God, and they're saying, holy, 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 and that the glory of God is fills the heavens and the earth. And so they, they actually, the angels have to cover themselves in this vision in Isaiah chapter 6. And Isaiah, when he looks upon the glory of God, he says, I am ruined, I am, I am coming apart, is the metaphor that he uses, because I am a man of unclean lips. Now, we have to remember Isaiah is a prophet of God. This is a man who actually spoke with God. He was chosen by God to be God's official spokesperson at the time that he was alive. And yet, in that very Isaiah, who is speaking for the Almighty God. Now, think about, just think about it for a second. We all pray to God. God speaks to us through means, you know, through our conscience. He can speak to us even through a dream. I'm not saying that he don't normally does that, but he can if he wants to. And he speaks to us primarily through the scriptures. But for God to single us out like he did Moses on, in the, on Mount Sinai, to God, for God to actually give a vision to someone like he did to the apostles, uh, Peter, James, and John on, on the... Um, on the mountain of transfiguration when they saw Jesus and the glory of God on Jesus. For God to single someone out, in that, that's, a big, that's, a, that's a big you know, honor to be the person that's been singled out by God to actually speak for God. And it is this one representative by God in Isaiah chapter 6 who says, I am a man of unclean lips. So the man that God has chosen to be his official spokesperson is saying, I'm not worthy of God. When Jesus uh, went to the baptism with John the Baptist, John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ coming forward and he says, I am not worthy to even uh, do the sandals of, of his feet. Okay, Brother. Can you give the That's a great question. Basically, a prophet, the word prophecy, usually when people think of the word prophecy, they're usually thinking about predicting the future. So I'm going to prophesy that such and such is going to happen. And they identify prophecy was just that. Technically, a prophecy is just a word from God. So if God speaks to you and he says, Alan, I want you to tell the people of Acts Reformed Church X. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a prophecy about the future. It could just be a message from God. Now, I'm not, now the, the issue here, and that's, I'm going to get to the second part with the prophets of the modern day. Uh, and so the reason why it's a prophecy is because it's a, it's a word from God. It's a specific, special revelation, which is contrasted from general revelation. General revelation is the revelation that God gives to us through creation itself. The Bible says, and I'm going to quote it in a moment, but the heavens declare the glory of God, the earth uh, displays the work of his hands. Or the skies display the works of his hands. So you have these ideas. This is general revelation. God is speaking to us through the creation, through our conscience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But special revelation is when God is speaking to someone like Moses, and he says, Moses, Moses, I am that I am, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Th these are conversations, and he says, I want you to go to the, the Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. You know, th These are prophecies because God is speaking through them. So a prophet is basically singled out by God, and he speaks for God. This is different from a priest. The priest, on the other hand, speaks to God on our behalf. So imagine yourself. If, if uh, you're the people of, of Israel, because we, are, we believe we are the true Israel of God, right? 
You're the people of Israel. If I'm the prophet, my job is to come down metaphorically from the mountain and give you the word that God has given me to share with you. If I'm your priest, my job is to, to take your offerings, turn around and offer them to him. There's a difference between... The, now, you can be both the prophet and the priest, uh, but these are two different offices. That are, I hope that answered that first question anyway. Now, the second question has to do with the, the issue of the charismatic movement. Now, the charismatic movement as we know it today is basically the outgrowth of... Uh, we, we have movements of the charismatic... Char, charismata, by the way, uh, comes from the Greek word charis, which means gift. So when the Bible talks about the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 and 14, it's the word charis. And so the charismatic movement emphasizes that the charisms of the sign gifts, such as the gift of apostle and prophecy and healing and all these sign gifts, that there was supposed to be a, supposedly a big explosion of that. And this is what Pentecostalism is actually based on. Uh, this has to do a lot with the Azusa Street revival that happened in the early part of the 20th century. And, uh, but they didn't start there. These things were happening before that. And there's a lot of these movements happening within the Methodists in the 19th century, but there's, they, they can trace this back to these kinds of ideas to the Montanists. And so they believe that God has given us a new Pentecost, that's why they're called Pentecostals, uh, Pentecost in which he is empowering people to have these sign gifts, and one of those sign gifts that they believe exists is the gift of prophecy. Now, this also affects your view of the end times, because if you believe that in the future... Because the book of Revelation, if you're a futurist, you believe that the bulk, of the, book, the bulk of the book of Revelation is future. And the book of Revelation talks about prophets and prophecies and signs and wonders, etc., etc. So that means that if you're a futurist, that means that there will be prophets in the future. Most, many people are expecting Moses and Elijah to come back. So they are expecting that to happen in that sense. But what these people are saying is that God can speak currently to us through prophets. The issue that we, especially in the Reformed community, is that we believe that God stopped speaking that way at the end of the first century. And that is the reason why we are no longer adding books to the Bible. You see, if God continued to speak through apostles and prophets today, then they could write stuff down and we could start adding them to the Bible, just as they were doing it in the New Testament. The, the, uh, the, all they had in the New Testament time was the Old Testament. They, the, the, the Tanakh is what they refer to it. And mostly, of course, they had the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. But as the churches were congregating after the ascension of Christ, they were telling the stories of the, of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And as time went on, records started to be written down. But, but particularly, what first came were the letters of Paul. So Paul writes Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, he writes Romans, he starts writing all these other letters, and these letters start circulating. And because Paul is an apostle, and Peter's an apostle, they, these letters are in circulation, and then you've got other books that are being added to that list of books that are circulating among the church, and people are considering them scripture because they are the words of God. But what happens? The apostles die. And once the apostles die, the gift of prophecy, we believe, died with them. So when we're looking at the modern-day prophets, they're trying to say that the that gift of prophecy, but they don't add to the Bible. That's the interesting thing. They, you don't see even Benny Hinn, who, who has claimed in the past anyway that he has the gift of prophecy and that God is revealing this or that to him. Uh, even Benny Hinn does not say, well, my new book has to be added to the Bible. He, he doesn't go to that extent. But does that answer your question? Or is it, or is it, okay. All right, so let's go to uh, the next portion. Oh, yes. So I just wanted to comment on it um, to Al's question as well. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with the, uh, this verse, but in Hebrews um, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Long ago, many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So, like, I, I think when someone will claim to be that holds the title of prophet, I think they're... Like, without saying it, they're questioning the sufficiency of Christ's supremacy mm -hmm. of overriding, like, the ne the need for prophecy, like, today. Mm -hmm. In the sense of, like, where God needs that representative. Our final representative now is Christ. Right. To give us that complete revelation of God. And, you know, because Jesus even says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
Exactly. Because Jesus Christ is the ultimate revelation. That, 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 that verse is perfect right there. And I believe we covered it, uh, it, it we t touched on it in the earlier uh, Sunday schools when we talked about the nature of Scripture and Revelation, in which we're basically saying that the sufficiency of Scripture is based upon the fact that God is no longer speaking. The revelation has been given, the deposit has been made, and now we can move past that. Uh, but again, if, you, if you're a futurist, you do believe that God's going to speak again uh, through prophets. But there are some people that believe that it's already happening now. Bro brother? Okay. So I've heard people talk about the word of wisdom where God gives them something that you know, nobody knows, but mm -hmm. God knows, and then they know it. Mm -hmm. um, is that incompatible with reformed circles? Like, can God not do that? Or will that happen? I actually don't, because I believe, because in reform, in reform circles, there are different views. So there, there are people that are just full on cessationist such as John MacArthur, but then there are people like Wayne Grudem, who is a little more sympathetic towards the charismata. So, but the idea of the word of wisdom, I, I think it would depend on how you understand that. And, and that could just be understood as, as in the nature of discernment. Uh, I remember Walter Martin, uh, the, 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 the founder of CRI, the original Bible Answer Man, uh, used to say that, that he was at a Christian bookstore at one point and he was talking to some man and then he felt like a presence and then there was a young man behind him, and he, and he sensed that this guy was part of the, the Mormon movement or one of the Latter-day Saint breakoffs. And then he said, "Which are you from Missouri or are you from Utah's church? And the guy was like, I'm from the Utah church. And he said that was the discerning spirits. Now, other Christians might disagree with Walter Martin on that, but I'm just saying. Uh, brother? Well, I had a question about the original catechism that was given to the Uh, are you saying that okay, that so the catechism the doesn't catechism ask that? Mm -hmm. Question. Mm -hmm. had, yeah. And then the answer that they give mm -hmm. does not say anything about our responsibility to preach the gospel. Well, that that was covered in other catechism questions. So e each catechism question is covering a different element, but but. One of the things, and I'm, in a way, I'm glad you're asking this question because a lot of people don't understand that all of the doctrines of Christianity, every doctrine that we find in the Bible, they're all tied together. They're not separate doctrines that are disconnected or disjointed from one another. They're all connected. And so everything that we do, as I'm going to continue with my outline, is to the glory of God. So whether it's every element of that. So it, this, this particular thing doesn't cover the Great Commission per se because it was already covered in previous questions. But I, I don't know. Oh, you have another question? Yeah, I was just going to comment on that too. And I would even um, affirm that the answer in glorifying God is to obey his commandments, which encompasses the command to go preach the gospel and then to enjoy him forever mm -hmm. on this side of heaven as we're here on earth, but also fully and finally in eternity, um, as we enjoy God, we will have that desire to share him, right? Like we're enjoying a good meal, and we're like, mm -hmm. man, this meal is good. We want to share it to the person next to us. Um, that's like how I would see, like, as we enjoy Christ, we would have that transformed heart to say, man, let me share this with my neighbor. Let me share this with my family member, my coworker, things like that. So even though mm -hmm. it's not saying it explicitly, mm -hmm. I think that that answer, like some of mm -hmm. the essence and nature of what the, um, what the implications are to that. Yes, and as a matter of fact, the, the following the commandments of God, that was what was we covered, well, that's what I covered last week on question 80. So, it, so remember, we have to understand these are 81 questions. If you just sit down, because the, the catechism is not very big. You, you, if you get the catechism, you know, it's a, you know, I, I can't remember how many pages it was, it's not very long. You can pick up the thing, read the whole thing in one setting and, and get all the information. All these doctrines are tied together. So they're not this doctrine, well, this question doesn't, re doesn't deal with this other issue. Well, they're all connected if you read them as a package deal. So let me continue here. God will not give his supreme glory to his creation. I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images, Isaiah 42.8. 
Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 4.10, when Jesus was tempted by Satan. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was dark, and professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So here God is condemning us but in a, because in a very real sense we are all pagan at heart. And uh, John Calvin famously said that, our, that the human heart is a factory of idols. And God is saying, do not give the honor that is due to me to my creation. You give that honor to me. It belongs to me. Man is to glorify God because he is created in his image. For a man ought not to have the head, his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. 1 Corinthians 11, 7. It is sin to, that separates us from the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. God is glorified in both election and reprobation. The doctrines of grace are the biblical teaching that define the goal and means of God's perfect work of redemption. They tell us that God is the one who saves for his own glory and freely. This is from James White's The Potter's Freedom. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that he would be holy and blameless before him in love by predestinating us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he graciously bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our transgression, according to the riches of his grace, which he caused to abound to us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him for an administration of the fullness of times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth. In him... In him we also have been made an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, to the end that we who first have hoped in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also are listening to the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of your inheritance unto the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory." So our predestination, the work of salvation, is for his glory as well. Ephesians 1, 4 through 14. The next is a quotation from Dr. Robert Morey's book, Studies in the Atonement. A passing over in that God allows certain sinners to remain under condemnation, he does not elect them to salvation that can be called passive reprobation. A divine decree that certain sinners shall go to hell because of their sin and for the glory of God God's justice. This can be called positive reprobation. So here we have the glory of God in salvation and also in condemnation. Because in condemnation, God is glorified in his justice because justice is one of his attributes. And what if God, wanting to demonstrate his wrath on, and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath, having been prepared for the destruction and in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand? for glory. Now we're dealing with sanctification, which, we, which I talked about in one of the Sunday schools. Every thought, word, and deed is to glorify God. When God bid, bids his people, come let us reason together, Isaiah 118, we see that we like, we, like God, are capable of rational thought and communication. God has given us our mental abilities to serve and glorify him. It is part of the greatest commandment of the law that we should love the Lord thy God with all thy mind. Matthew 22, 37. This is from Always Ready by uh, Dr. Greg Bonson, the late Dr. Greg Bonson. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the tearing down of strongholds, as we tear down speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. So the, our thoughts, our actions, our discussions, when we witness to people, 
when we are simply bearing our testimony, when we're talking to people in our lives, whether you're being a, hu a good husband to your wife, good wife to your husband, father or mother to your children, good children to your parents, friends, cousins, everything you are, it is all supposed to be done to the glory of God. Years ago, I remember I was talking about how there were people that said that there were certain things that were appropriate to do in a worship service. And I said, well, I think it depends on the context. For example, let's say LeBron James is uh, considered one of the greatest basketball players of all time, at least in the top five for sure. And he recently broke the all-time scoring record of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, which Kareem held for about 40 years. LeBron James, now I don't know his personal life or his testimony, whether he professes Christ. I don't know anything about his personal life. But let's say hypothetically that LeBron James was a Christian and that he had devoted himself to service to God. He could actually say, hypothetically, that he would live, he would work as hard as he could for excellence to be the best basketball player that he could be and one of the greatest of all time and do it to the glory of God. I, agree, I believe that. I don't think anyone would disagree that if LeBron James says, I, would de I dedicate my entire career, everything, every accomplishment I ever made to the glory of God. Now, does this mean that in the middle of a church service, LeBron James can just get up and go dunk the ball in the middle of a sermon by Pastor Jordan? No. There is an appropriate time and an appropriate place to do certain things. And so we have to have discernment. He can dunk the ball to the glory of God in the middle of a game. He's not supposed to do that while we're in the middle of a sermon or a Sunday school. As Christians, we believe in God's omnipresence. Now, I don't know if everyone is familiar with the term omnipresence. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, seven. Okay, so omnipresence, the divine attribute of being all present. God is present everywhere with his entire being at the same time. He is not limited by space and should not be considered as being enormously big or located in one place rather than another. God is both nearby and far away, filling heaven and earth, Jeremiah 23, 24. Though God is present everywhere, he manifests his presence in different ways, in different situations to bless, warm, comfort, rebuke, reward, or punish. There is nowhere people can go to escape God. Psalm 139, 7-10. And worship is not confined to one place. John 4, 20-24. This is from uh, the Greg Allison's Baker Compact Dictionary of Theological Terms. So, because God is omnipresent uh, and holy, Martin Luther taught that we are to live Coram Deo, before the face of God. Walter Elwell explained the teaching of Nicholas Herman, known as Brother Lawrence, who, who lived between 1611 and 1691. He said, Having sought to do everything for the glory of God, with a consciousness of God's presence, Brother Lawrence's position can, be best be de can best be described in his own words. Quote, The time of business does not with me differ from the time of prayer. And in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in a great tranquility, as it were, upon my knees at the blessed sacrament. He taught, this sums up your entire call and duty, to adore God and to love him without worrying about the rest. This is from Walter Owell's Evangelical Dictionary. <clears throat> Even our deaths glorify God. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this, but now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. This is Jesus talking to Peter in John 21, 18 through 19. The end game of all creation is prophesied by God. I have sworn by myself, thy word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance, Isaiah 45, 23. So this is a prophecy that God says, to me every knee shall bow, every, every tongue shall confess or swear or allegiance. The fulfillment is found in the consummation of the messianic kingdom. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 10 through 11. So Paul quotes from Isaiah 45, 23, that is a reference to Yahweh, Almighty God, and he finds the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ is Yahweh. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the, God, to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he has accepted who put all things in subjected, subjection to him. And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. All in all, this is when the messianic reign is consummated and then God is glorified by being God, all in all. Finally, and they sang the song of Moses, the slave of God and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works. O Lord God, the Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Revelation 15, 3 through 4. Now, let me see how much time I have. Okay. During the Protestant Reformation, there were, there were five solas that were championed by the reformers, Luther, Calvin, etc. One was sola fide, justification by faith alone. And sola fide, justification by faith alone, is by Sola gratia, which means by grace alone, the unmerited or demerited favor, the undeserved favor, favor of God. And it is done by the imputed righteousness of Christ alone. So we as Christians, as, as Protestants, reformers, we believe that the righteousness that Christ lived, the entire life that he lived that was perfect, was offered up as a sacrifice. And that sacrifice, that perfect life and perfect sacrifice is credited to our account. This is the doctrine of justification, which uh, Brother Eric Ramirez covered in his Sunday school. And our sin is credited to him on the cross. So we are justified by faith alone, by grace alone, by the imputed righteousness of Christ alone. Sola fide, sola gratia, solus Christus is Christ alone. And we know this on the basis of the authority of Scripture alone as the infallible authority. That's why we, we talk about the authority of sola scriptura, which brings us to the fifth sola, and that's soli deo gloria, glory to God alone. This fifth sola is the end game. Everything that happens in our life, from the creation of the heavens and the earth that declare the glory of God, creation of man as the, the image bearer, the fall of man, the plan of salvation, all the prophets, all the sacrifices, all the wars, all the justice that God has implemented, the, the salvation of sinners, our regeneration, our justification, our glorification when, on the day of judgment when Christ returns and we are glorified in our bodies for those who are still alive at that point when our bodies are glorified or for those who have passed on to be with the Lord their spirit will reunite with their body. Their body will be glorified and they will be in the perfect state. They will attain glorification. But the purpose of our glorification is ultimately so that we can glorify God. And with that, I'll end the Sunday school. Heavenly Father, thank you once again. We just uh, want to immerse ourselves in your word, feed on you, as you are the only, the only one that makes sense of this world. Our very existence, our very thoughts, our very worldviews, all the philosophies of men, they all fail to make sense. You, your revelation is the only one that makes sense. It is the only truth that really matters ultimately in, in this cruel world. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.